Uh, if there's anything that we've seen over our seven-week study in Psalm 103, it's that you have benefits that are designed to make you big on the inside. And, and what's of most importance is what's going on inside of you. That's what takes precedence, the inside. Not the outside, the inside. That's what has the priority. But I do want to say this, whatever is happening on the inside will show up on the outside. And if you have a big life on the inside, it will manifest in a harvest of blessing at the right time. But if you have something you need to overcome, first of all, welcome to the human race, right? Welcome to the club. Because we've all got things we need to overcome. Patterns and habits and addictions and reactions. We all have mountains we've got to climb and walls we've got to scale and chains we need to break and battles we need to win. Everyone wants to be an overcomer. We just don't want to admit that we have anything that we need to overcome. But through the fact that you are forgiven healed and redeemed because you have been crowned, dignified, and satisfied, you have the power to overcome every challenge, every obstacle, every attack. Because of the blessings, the benefits bestowed on you by your heavenly Father, by your benefactor, guess what? You are an overcomer. In 1 John chapter 5, the Bible says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? As far as God is concerned, if you're a believer, you're an overcomer. It's who you are because of whose you are. You overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of your testimony. Overwhelming victory is yours through him who loved you. God has provided everything you will ever need and more. God has provided everything you need, spirit, soul, and body. He's provided everything you need to be mentally, emotionally, socially, and physically whole. But... We must appropriate what God has provided. And that's what this final message in the 103 series is all about. Psalm 103. Let's read it. A Psalm of David. Let's read it aloud together in a strong voice one more time. Ready? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Amplified Bible has that last line saying this, so that your youth renewed is like the eagles, strong, overcoming, soaring. Let me read something to you. When the psalmist mentions the renewal of the eagle, he is referring to the molting process in an eagle's life. As eagles age, their beaks and talons become encrusted with calcium, thus neither is sharp as sharp as it once was. When this happens, the aging eagle cannot hunt as effectively as he once did. As he ages, he also loses some of his feathers. When this happens, it causes his body to whistle in the air as he dives toward his prey. This destroys his ability to hunt in silence, thus further reducing his effectiveness as a hunter. When the eagle enters this period of his life, he'll descend from soaring in the heights above and find a place in the rocks. There, he'll pluck out all of his feathers break off his own calcium-encrusted beak against the rocks. He'll even scratch his talons against the rocks until they're reduced to nubs. At this point, the eagle is absolutely vulnerable and defenseless. But during this time, a wonderful thing begins to happen. One day, the feathers of the eagle begin to grow back. 
His beak will also grow back. His talons regrow as sharp and as long as ever before. After a time, the eagle will step out of the ro- from the rocks, flap his great wings, and take to the skies once again, renewed. Listen, you may be growing old on the outside, but you're growing younger on the inside. Yeah, the Bible says our outward man is perishing, but our inward person is being renewed day by day. And when the winds of adversity blow, you will mount up with wings as eagles. You will run and not get weary. You'll walk and not faint. You will use adversity to your advantage, and even the attacks of the wicked one will only cause you to elevate. So how does that happen? How how does that go from the pages of our Bible like to your work life, your family life, to impacting your your finances and your friendships? Like how does it go from theology into your day-to-day life? It happens, our main text says, through the process of renewal. He renews your youth. George Whitfield said the renewal of our nature is a work of great importance. It is not to be done in a day. We have not only a new house to build up, but an old one to pull down. Like you may have some things that need to be pulled down. Some strongholds, and we'll get to that in a minute. But know this. As far as the Bible is concerned, your life is not winding down. It's moving up. Matter of fact, I want you to turn to somebody next to you this morning and tell them, you're moving on up. Go ahead, tell them. I almost thought about having you respond, dynamite, but some of us wouldn't get it. Your best days are not behind you. Your best days are ahead of you. The path of the righteous is as a shining light that shines brighter and brighter until that day. Listen to me. God's heart, God's desire, God's destiny for you is to go from strength to strength, from glory to glory, and from faith to faith. Or or, or as the Amplified Bible says it in our target text today, all of God's benefits are introduced into your life so that you become strong, overcoming, and soaring. Man, let the weak say, I am strong. His strength is made perfect in my weakness. The people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong and of good courage. Be strong and of good courage. Have I not told you, be strong and of good courage. So to do this vitally important principle justice, let's let's go to the definitive New Testament passage on renewal. Open your Bible to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. What we're about to look at is the process of renewal. And it is a process. It is, in a nutshell, the process of spiritual formation, the process of discipleship. It's learning, it's growing, it's changing. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. This is how the giants in your life get driven out little by little. This isn't something that happens immediately or automatically when we believe. It's not. It starts then, but it lasts a lifetime. Eugene Peterson, who wrote the Message Bible, he called it a long obedience in the same direction. See, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you the moment you believe in Jesus, and he provides a whole new orientation to our thinking. But our thinking itself is not instantaneously changed. Like the ruts of the old life, they're not easy to get out of. Some of our ways of thinking are deeply ingrained, and they don't disappear overnight. In other words, like some of us have gotten out of the world, but the world hasn't gotten out of us. A verse we mention often, um, but we'll look at it from a different angle today, a different vantage point today. As a matter of fact, this is one of my favorite verses, as many of you know, and I've been looking deeply into this verse for now, going on 40 years, and we're still, by the grace of God, 
excavating new treasure from it. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul the Apostle writes, I beseech you, therefore, whenever you see a therefore, you got to find out what it's there for. He's saying, I beseech you, based on everything I've already written to you, from chapters 1 through chapter 11, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, not, not in your own strength, not by your own merit, not in your flesh. Your flesh can't produce anything spiritual. No, but by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Other translations say, which is your spiritual worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, metamorphosized. By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. No transformation takes place without renewing your mind. The J.B. Phillips translation puts it like this. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within. Again, no transformation takes place without renewing your mind. No change takes place without changing your thinking. Because every action begins as a thought. Like if you don't think it, you won't do it. And that works both with the good and the bad. Watch this in Proverbs 4.23 in the Good News translation. It says this. Be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. So if you accept a thought, whether it's right or wrong, it shaped your life. If growing up somebody said to you, you know, you're worthless, you're no good, you're, you don't matter, you're ugly, you're stupid, you, you, you're uncoordinated, nobody likes you. If you accepted that, it shaped you. Now, you don't have to accept what other people say. I said, you don't have to accept what other people say. You can reject rejection, right? You can reject destructive criticism. You can reject ill-informed opinions and judgmentalism. But, but you, are, you were probably told things as a child that were not true, but you believed it. And you're still acting on utterly false information decades later. You see, your feelings don't shape your life. Your beliefs do. And it doesn't have to be true. If you believe it, it shapes your life. So today, what we're really talking about is mind management. Managing your thought life. Like why? Because your thoughts control your life. For as he thinketh in his heart, Proverbs 23 says, so is he. Listen, all of life is about change. Right? When Jesus came in contact with anyone, things started to change. He loved them the way that they were, but he didn't leave them the way that they were. And I'm here to tell you today that God wants to change you. He loves you just as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you as you are. There's always something that God is trying to move us from and move us toward. And when we resist that, when we resist God-inspired change in our lives, that's where we begin to lose the battle. And we lose our peace and our joy and our purpose. People say, well, well, I was just born that way. I, I, I was just born ornery. I was just born critical. I was just born mean. I was just born, you go ahead and fill in the blank. Listen, that's not an excuse. Especially if you've been born again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, born again is not a religion. Born again is not a label. Born again, being born again is a directive from Jesus himself. He said, most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So, so, so listen, I don't doubt that you were born that way, but that's why you have to receive Jesus and be born again because it's not about how you start. It's about how you finish. 
And understand this, changing always starts with choosing. And if you will choose to learn how to manage your mind, you'll know how to manage your life. Your mind is a battlefield on the one hand, and it is the key to your peace and joy on the other. Because an unmanaged mind leads to tension, a managed mind leads to tranquility. An unmanaged mind leads to pressure. A managed mind leads to peace. An unmanaged mind leads to fear. A managed mind leads to faith. An unmanaged mind leads to worry, but a managed mind leads to worship. An unmanaged mind leads to conflict and chaos. A managed mind leads to confidence and self-control. An unmanaged mind leads to stress, but a managed mind leads to strength, security, and self-control. Know this, whatever gets your attention gets you. I said whatever gets your attention gets you. All temptation happens in the mind. Pride, lust, bitterness, hatred, prejudice, anger, fear, resentment, greed, worry, they all start in your mind. So there's a battle in your brain. That's why you get mentally fatigued. Ephesians 6 talks about the helmet of salvation because of the battle in your brain. And the enemy tries to drop some brain bombs. So you better put on the salvation helmet. Filter your thoughts through being saved. You need to think saved. The reason why the battle for your mind is so intense is because it is your greatest asset. Satan wants to control your mind. The world, the culture wants to control your mind. But no one has the right nor the power to control your mind but you. Like you have three enemies in the battle for your brain. The flesh, the world, and the devil. That's why it's so challenging to change sometimes. Like that unholy trinity tries to keep you from all your good intentions. And they don't give up ground easily. You you will have to fight the good fight of faith. You're going to have to guard with vigilance what God has given you. See, understand this. A new orientation in your thinking leads to a new orientation in your behavior. It's the old adage by Emerson who said, Sow a thought and you reap an action. Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. Your destiny is tied directly to and starts with your thoughts. And only you can control your thoughts. The world can't. The worldwide marketing machine, they can't. The devil can't. But are you ready? Even God is not going to control your mind for you. Watch this. In Romans 8, verse 6 in the New Living, it says, So letting, this is something you let happen. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Please hear me today. You don't have to think about what you've been thinking about. You don't have to. You can change the channel. You have the mind of Christ. You have the God-given, spirit-anointed power of self-control. You have the power to manage your thought life. As Pastor Elena introduced the term to us some time ago, it's time to do some metacognition. What is metacognition? It's to think about what you're thinking about. Think about your thinking. So the question is, how do you mind your mind? Oh, it's getting quiet in here this morning. It's getting quiet. Listen, how do you steward your thought life? How do you change the way you think? How is your mind renewed? Here's how. Ready? When you feed your mind, free your mind, and focus your mind. Say it with me today. Ready? Free, feed your mind, free your mind, and focus your One more time, nice and loud. Ready? Feed your mind, 
free your mind and focus your mind. Let's briefly uh, tackle all three. First, you feed your mind with truth. Not with what's trending. Not, 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 not with what the talking heads want to feed you. Not with what the propagandists want to fill you with. Not with the algorithms that your favorite search engine wants to manipulate you with. Not what your goofy friends say. Pastor Elena also says this all the time. She says, don't let a poor man tell you how to be rich. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, to which I've added, ready? Don't let a gossip tell you how to be discreet. Don't let a hothead tell you how to stay calm. And don't let a wolf tell you how to be a sheep. So we have to ask the question today, what are you feeding into your mind? Truth or trash? Jesus made it plain. He was praying to the Father in John chapter 17, and he said this, Thy word is truth. Mano a mano, face to face with Satan himself in the wilderness after 40 days where he's been fasting, starvation has begun to set in. The devil's first temptation to Jesus was for him to feed himself with faux food. With food that might satisfy his flesh, but not his soul. And Jesus tells the devil, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then in John chapter 8, then Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, so this is for believers, ready? If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Which leads to our second point, not only should you feed your mind, but secondly, you must free your mind. You've got to free your mind from destructive thoughts. Your mind needs to be liberated. It needs to be delivered. It needs to be released. Because you are a prisoner of your own thoughts. You're a prisoner, ready, of the things that people told you and you believed. For instance, if you believe like everybody's out to get you, you will be paranoid, mistrusting, cynical, resentful, angry, and lonely with no semblance of peace and joy. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says that we are not ignorant of the devil's devices. He has schemes, he has plans and tactics and strategies and devices to snare you in order to imprison you. Listen, the enemy wants to keep you incarcerated to old ways of thinking. The enemy wants to keep you in bitterness. He wants to keep you in pride and in greed and self-centeredness and selfish ambition. He wants to keep you in bondage. He wants to keep you staying vengeful and, and, and vindictive. He wants to keep you in jealousy and covetousness. He wants to keep you in a place where you're stingy and self-absorbed. He wants to lull you asleep on a cot in a cerebral cell in your mind. So you're going to have to battle. You're going to have to fight. You're going to have to put in the effort and engage. It won't be easy, but it will be worth it. You're going to have to engage in spiritual warfare and free your mind. Watch. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 4 and 5 says, For the weapons of our warfare. How many of you know you have spiritual weapons? Maybe second service will respond better than first today. I don't know. I said, how many of you know you have spiritual weapons? Yeah. Right? Ephesians 6 lists them all. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Let me give you the simplest definition of a stronghold. It's a lie that you believed. For the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, or some translations there say imaginations, and every high thing, every proud ideation that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. How many of you know our, our nation's got some strongholds? And our culture is trying to build new ones. They are arguments. They are imaginations. They, they, let me do it this way. They're imaginations. 
that exalt themselves proudly and arrogantly against the knowledge of God. For instance, my Bible says, and your Bible says, that he made them, male and female, created he them. So my Bible says there are exactly, ready, two genders. Not three, not five, not 17. That's an ideation, that's an argument, that's an imagination that, sa- that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and it needs to be cast down. I said it needs to be cast down. No, 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 no. But then, but then, not only ideations, but now on a very specific and personal level, uh, uh, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought. Okay, now that's us. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The obedience of Christ, not obedience to Christ. Listen, listen. This is what most people think this, this says. Oh, oh, that's a bad thought. I gotta bring it, I gotta bring it into obedience to Christ. I'm gonna bring my thoughts into obedience to Christ. I'm gonna do it. Listen, if that's the way you go about this, that the, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna think that thought. I'm not gonna think that thought. I'm not gonna that is a surefire way to think that thought. But If you bring that thought, that imagination, that argument, even that stronghold, if a lie that you believe, a false value system, uh, materialism, secularism, an antichrist agenda, or again on a personal level, if you bring your bad attitude, I'm never going to forgive that person. Or I could never forgive myself. Or I'll never amount to anything. Or I'll never be good enough. Strongholds. If you bring that thought, that imagination, that argument, that stronghold to the obedience of Christ, you say, well, what is that? Ready? If you're taking notes, just jot down Philippians chapter 2. Because in Philippians chapter 2, we are told exactly what that is. That's where it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, coming in the likeness of man, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of of the cross. The obedience of Christ is his death on the cross. Listen to me. If you'll bring those debilitating thoughts, those old ways of thinking, those deceptions, those lies, if I bring them to the cross and I see my Savior, I see my substitute, I see that he was made to be sin, though he knew no sin, that I might be made the righteousness of God in him. If I, if I see him, if I've got those thoughts and I see him, and I say, wait a second, you did that for me? You loved me like that? You loved me like that so I could be free from sin and all of its devastating effects. Listen, the old song says, the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Like that's how you deal with strongholds. You have to utterly demolish them by the power of the finished work of Christ on Calvary's cross. Feed your mind. Free your mind. And finally, focus your mind. The book of Hebrews tells us whenever you encounter temptation, trouble, trial, tribulation, trauma, whenever you encounter that, Hebrews 12 says, fix your eyes on Jesus. Don't focus on the problem. Focus on the promise. Don't focus on the crisis. Focus on Christ. Don't focus on your limitations. Focus on your Lord. Watch this in Colossians 3. It says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. 
Set, set your mind specifically on what's happening around the throne of God. That's what it's telling us. And that actually means two things to us. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible says, as he's seated there, he's ever living to make intercession for us. Jesus is always standing in the gap for us. Let me make it simple. Jesus is praying for us. How many of you know if Jesus is praying for you, everything's going to be all right? So guess what? Focus on that. Number two, though, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, and that is the place of ultimate authority and favor. So here's where, where the in him realities begin to really kick in. If you are in him and every believer is in him, if you are in him and he's seated at the right hand of the Father, then you too are seated in him. Then when God looks at you, he sees you in his son and therefore you too have a place of authority. You too have a place of favor. And if you've got the authority that has been given to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and if you're Life is surrounded by the favor of God. Nothing else matters. So focus on that. Who renews your youth like the eagles. Let me close with this. The word renew in Psalm 103 and throughout the Hebrew Bible is the word kadash. And it means to be new, to make anew, to produce something new. Like this is not remodeling the house. This is not repairing the house. This is taking it down to the studs. New plumbing, new electric, new sheetrock. Really, it's laying a new foundation. This is gutting the house and rebuilding it to the point of not being able to recognize it from what was once there. But the etymology of the word kodash is primarily that of, listen carefully, cutting or polishing a sword. Kodash, renew, cutting or polishing a sword. So when you see the word renew, kodash, it's the word picture of a sword that's being sharpened and polished. Swords can get rusty. Swords can get dull. So you have to polish them and you have to sharpen them so that they keep cutting, they keep protecting, they keep producing. And in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, we're told this. For the word of God is living and powerful, ready, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Listen, the glorified Christ in Revelation, the Bible says he's got a sword coming out of his mouth. The sword is the word of God. Listen, the reason why some of our hearts have grown dull, the reason why we're not at our best, the reason why you might not feel like you're on the cutting edge anymore. Listen, you, you, you're not quite as sharp intellectually or engaging socially or effective and fruitful spiritually. You're not as secure, as secure emotionally as you, as you could be or you should be. It's because you've let your sword go unused and get all dusty and rusty. But if you will sharpen your sword, if you'll polish your sword, if you'll polish up on the Word of God and learn the Word and study the Word and meditate the Word of God, it will transform your life. Right? Right? This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you'll have good success. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the way of the sinners or sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delights is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate 
day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water who brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf won't even wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And then Jesus says this. Jesus himself says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done unto you. Renew your mind and change your life. He renews you so that you're strong, overcoming, and soaring. Amen, amen, amen. Stand with me.